Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our College Sport Communicators live webinar. We're pleased to offer this session on working with ice hockey statistics, stat rules, and producing accurate stats. Thanks for joining this important session as we discuss ways to assist CSC members in all areas of working with men's and women's ice hockey statistics and stat rules. Our presenters are leaders in college hockey communications and statistics, are here to offer their thoughts and expertise and to take your questions. As for questions, please feel free to ask at any time. Just place them in the Q&A function of this Zoom. You can use the chat function to comment, but please place all questions in the Q&A channel. That's where we'll be looking for them. I am Jenna Jorgensen, Communications and Public Relations Coordinator with the Stillwater Area School District and a former hockey SID. I will serve as our webinar moderator today. As a reminder, we're recording this webinar and you can watch it as an on-demand session later on the CSC website and YouTube page. We will also offer it on numerous podcast channels, so invite your fellow CSC colleagues to listen and watch this too. All right, so we've got lots to cover, so let's get started. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today and remember to ask those questions. Today, we have three impressive hockey contacts that bring experience across different divisions and leagues. Our first panelist is Elisa Mitten, Sports Information Coordinator and Home Event Manager at Windsor. We're also joined by RIT Director of Athletic Communications, Tim Volkman, as well as McGill Communications Officer, Earl Zuckerman. So to kick things off, we're gonna start at the beginning and start with pregame. Uh, here, we're gonna talk about the differences in staffing and setup uh, to cover your hockey games. So Tim, why don't you lead us off? Um, talk a little bit about your staff members, what they each do and the programs you use for your games. Ooh, I think you're muted, Tim. I know it's such a habit. Right off the bat, I blew it. No. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. Thanks everybody uh, for joining us today. Um, with RIT, uh, we actually, um, have five people on our stack crew. We have someone that inputs, someone that calls. We have two people that do plus minus, and then yours truly typically does goal review. Now that is, I, I know we're blessed with a lot of hockey fans and hockey students that love watching hockey and all they can do is want to watch hockey. So uh, I know that's not a typical setup of a lot of schools. So, but that we're, we're lucky to have that set up at our school and we do use uh, NLS for hockey, the genius product uh, we've been using since the start here at RIT. I mean, why wouldn't they want to work in a press box like that? Like you're bringing us right? the full experience. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so Elisa, you have talked when we were on our pre-call, um, you have a stack crew experience um, and how much well, you love it. Well, I do love stack crew. It's yeah. no um, secret to all the SIDs in Canada. It's my favorite stack program. Um, but we actually never used stack crew for hockey. So to me, it was something that I um, was always interested in doing, but we never uh, did it. So we actually use league stat. Um, and it is a program that is, I think, very user friendly. Earl, I'll let him explain, expand a little bit more because he's like our connoisseur of League Stat and he knows every little function that it does. Um, but we do use League Stat um, across most of our conferences, um, I believe. Earl, do you want to expand on that? Yeah. How many people do you have statting your games? Oh, for me? Sorry. Um, one. <laughs> so a little bit so different we than don't different. It is a little bit different than Tim, but we also play out of a city owned arena. We don't have our own rink. Uh, so it's a community arena. So we don't have a press box. I don't have um, anything like that. Like we broadcast our games out of it off a folding table in the stands through a net. And my stack person is in the box with everybody. So, I mean, we have three sets of eyes with our clock and announcer as well, but it's just one person for us. Oh, that is a superhero setup. <laughs> Earl, talk about what you got going on. Well, we uh, there's three conference in Can in conferences in Canada: the OUA, which uh, McGill Night School plays in. Uh, then there's the Canada West and the Maritime Conference, which is called the Atlantic University uh, Sport, so AUS. Uh, we all use um, different <laughs> different setups. Um, the OUA, which is half the schools in Canada, uses league stat or it was recently renamed Hockey Tech, but most of us old timers call it still call it uh, League Stat. It was bought out, I think, about two years ago by a, a company called Hockey Tech. 
Um, uh, I find it's the most user friendly of them all. I've tried them all, and uh, I, I like Leakstat. It's it's very easy to work with, easy to correct issues. We typically use three people at a game. Uh, the official scorer, which is the guy that or the person that sits in the penalty box, takes the information from the the referee, and then we have someone upstairs in the press box, and usually an assistant with them. Ideally, one person calls out the stats, and the other one writes or enters the stats in the uh, in the database. And so our stats are entered live online, but they are also recorded by hand in case you have a um, power failure or something, you have to have sort of a backup plan in, in place. So that's typically what we do. Uh, we don't do plus minus uh, in most of our conferences. Uh, some of the women's hockey uh, conferences use plus minus. So it, it adds another couple of people to your staff. Um, we used to do plus minus and we stopped doing plus minus. And then anyway, it's, it's just become too much of a, uh, a headache to correct and, and resolve since we don't have official video review. If you had official video review in every, in every venue, then, uh, it's a lot easier to, to, um, get the plus minus if you have uh, an issue where you've, you've missed a couple players. So anyway, we typically use three for a game. Uh, and if we did plus minus, we would be adding two other people, one to, get the, the guys on the ice from one one team and someone taking care of the other team. And I thought one of the more interesting and innovative uh, things you mentioned at your school is that you don't do printing for stat updates. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, part of that is the, there's less media uh, coverage nowadays. The, the newspapers and TV and radio have shrunk drastically on their sports departments. Uh, Montreal, where I'm based, uh, used to have quite a lot of media covering our games. Now we have almost nobody covering the games other than the student media. So there isn't A, as, as a big a demand for it, uh, but B, uh, students really seem to be, especially the student reporters, seem to be into their phones and their little tablets and they do everything online. So we do all the stats. We have live stats for all of our games, home and away, and um you just get used to doing everything online. So we don't print anything anymore. And your coaches have adjusted to that just fine? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, there was initially, uh, you know, a period where they, they weren't really thrilled about it. Uh, but the, the school really um, forced the issue by saying that we had to be green uh, and, and stop waste of paper. Like in, in our football games, we used to use so much paper. And so uh, we just, over a period of a couple of years, we've slowly moved away from the printed uh, um, document and, and we just use the online stuff. Gotcha. So Tim, a good example here, um, headsets, so communication between your press box and your penalty box crew. Can you expand on that? Yeah, um, we are up in the press box here of the Gene Palacini Center, and you might be able to see down there, the box is all the way down there. So what we actually have, we actually have a, a ring down set up right here, um, right next to the stack food. As soon as you pick it up, it rings down there, and as soon as they pick it up, it rings up here. So it's a direct contact down to the press box, and uh, whenever there's penalties, whenever there's uh, any issues, things like that, we're in direct contact with the um, the folks down in the box. I know that might not be something that everybody can have set up, so that's why we have cell phones, right? Cell phones, uh, there's no more minutes that we have to pay for anymore. So if you have somebody just ready to go on the other one with their phone down in the box, that works uh, at just as well. And Elisa, Elisa, you have you sit in the or you sit in the penalty box. That was new yeah. to me. <laughs> How did that come to be? It's the only space to put us. <laughs> um, no, just because again of our situation in the community rank and our our dressing rooms are directly behind the benches. So like our men are behind the one bench and then the women are behind the other bench. Um, so we were able to, in order to get internet at our facility, we had to install it ourselves. So our former coaches of ours ran internet through the buildings and like through the ceiling of the rank to get to the webcast and they did it to the box. So I have a little plug in that I can plug in there. It was the only spot I can go. Interesting. All right. See, it's all across the so board. My, right. So what happens is my, the person doing our game sheet is also doing our live stats. Like we have one person doing it all because I don't have the space for more. Mm -hmm. uh, another big difference we talked about uh, between the U S and Canada and covering hockey is line charts. So Tim here in the U S can you tell us, what's on a line chart and when you exchange them and with who and 
and what all that means. <laughs> sure. Line charts are basically like uh, your shows all the people that are in your lineup for that. So um, I don't know exactly what the official or required time is to have line charts traded with the opposing team, but I always try to get them as to the other, especially we're on the road as soon as possible. This makes the people's lives easier when you have the line chart, right? You're not sharing the secret recipe to Coca-Cola when you give the other team your line chart. Um, and the other, our radio guys love that it has big numbers on it, big numbers and big last names is what I can put. If anybody wants an example of this, email me. I can I can send you my line chart. Um, I try to cram a lot into my line chart with you know stat leaders and um, uh, you know. A, a lot of different things, but um, having a line chart and then the starters, I think we have to have starters submitted 35 or 30 minutes before face off, give or take. I, I think we try to easily have them before that for our media people so people know the starting goalies, things like that. Um, so line charts are, they can be very polarizing. I know people, there's coaches that don't want the other team to see it until the very last minute, and there's other coaches that don't. Um, really care in a lot of ways. So communicate with your coach, communicate with the other SID on, ahead of time. That's the big thing. Reach out ahead of time, find out what their workflow is, find out what you're going to be dealing with. And if it's an instance where you're not going to get a line chart till closer to the game, you can be prepared for it, right? We're able to print off a lot for um, fans and uh, all our media, things like that. So having them ahead of time is a a uh, really big, important thing for us as well. So uh, everybody in Atlanta Hockey, the conference that RIT is in on the men's side, um, is really good about the line charts. So, yep. Um, big legible text is a big thing. I always do mine in black and white. I don't do. I don't run them in. I don't put any color on mine because you never know what's going to be printed on the other end. I've seen people put like colors on their line charts and they don't copy very well and it's hard to read. So uh, in my mind, black and white is the way to go on line charts. Polarizing was a good word for it, but I think you hit the nail on the head there. Like communicate with your league. This was something um, in the leagues I was in. One league had a league rule. They had a deadline of when the home SID had to have the line chart from the visiting SID. And um, so, yeah, that's something to, to figure out in the league you're in. Uh, a big difference in those early season games, though, we play Canadian teams for exhibition games. So on the Canadian side, you don't normally make line charts. So how would you talk about interacting with U.S. SIDs when those games happen? Either well, for me uh, personally, uh, when we play, when Miguel plays in NCAA school, we do produce a line chart. Uh, coaches in Canada are more reserved about giving out their lineup before they have to. So you have to have a good relationship with your coach and convince them that this is primarily going to the play-by-play uh, -play people. That's what I tell our coaches. Uh, the radio guys need this, they, and they have to memorize the lines, and they need this in advance. So when we play in NCAA school, uh, we always produce a line chart. Uh, it's I, I wish it was a, a mandated rule in, to, to have our regular season games like that as well, but uh, it's not. So I'm, I'm prepared. If an, if an SID from another school wants one, we'll produce one. I have one, a simple one that I use on an Excel sheet. Uh, it's not as nice looking, perhaps, as the uh, the one we just saw, but it's, uh, it's useful. It, it covers what needs to be covered. Is it the same for you, Alyssa? Yeah, same for us. Our coaches are very understanding that things are done differently in the U.S. than they are here. And we're a border city, right? So we play U.S. teams all the time. Um, so when it, we do play a U.S. school, they have absolutely no problem for producing a line chart and stuff. And I do notice that, like, Earl, when we play um, here in our conference, our teams will exchange a line chart themselves when they fill out the game sheet. Like, when they're given the game sheet, they'll send one over, like, a handwritten one. But it's just something that they you know, do and so like a written, not a written rule that they do. It's just like a common courtesy to each other. They'll provide it in advance to the other school, but it'll be like an hour before the game. Yeah, that's the uh, an agreement made between the coaches, the, the, the National Coaching uh, Association. I think that's what they're called. Uh, they um, sort of passed a, I don't know if it's a hard rule, but they have an agreement in place that whenever they um, play a team, the coaches exchange, or they send someone to exchange a depth chart with the other team, but it's very simply just pretty much numbers like 5, 8, 3, 21, 16, and 8. It, it's just lines with numbers, nothing more than that in most schools. And that is something in the U.S. Um, 
line charts are, Tim mentioned, you know, for your media and your play-by-play, -play, it's super, super helpful because it's a single sheet, but it includes names, pronunciations, um, season stats or career stats, perhaps under the player. A lot of times they'll include the officials names, which helps on the stat side of things to have that just easily accessible um, and scratches as well. So as we kind of get into a more of our stats discussion, um, that is a really helpful sheet when you're statting to have close by because you can double check. Oh, 22 isn't playing today. He scratched, you know, we got to relook at what number took that shot and things like that. So um, definitely something to get squared away the week. And that's a weekly thing, game day thing um, leading up to it. So as we get into it, let's start talking about the basics of stats. We can touch on icing, offsides, but we're going to start with shots on goal. Um, essentially, what we've kind of talked about in our in our planning call was if the goalie wasn't there, would the puck go in? That's in the simplest terms, um, how to determine if a if a shot is on goal. So, Elissa, can you give some examples of this? What are some odd plays of shots on goal? Um, a lot of times, like when I'm training a new staff, one of the things that I notice is they go to mark down a shot on net if it hits the post or if it hits the crossbar. And I said, and I say to them, would that have gone in if the goalie wasn't there? No. And I said, well, then it's not a shot. And that's exactly like when you said that in our planning call, I said, that's exactly what I tell them, right? Like, but it's hitting the crossbar. That is not a shot on net, right? If it's you're, if they're just dumping the puck down the ice not really a shot on that right like they weren't aiming for to shoot the puck unless it's an empty net and like they're trying to you know score but they're just dumping it that's not considered a shot on that either those are that's the first two that to come bring to up. like what how do you judge those calls that like wait were they attempting to put that on that or just getting it out of the zone what do you do in those situations for me i just i think you have to read the game and you have to find out what's going on right like if the game's you know, the, the, the team's one down and they've pulled the goalie for the extra man and they're like firing it down. You know what I mean? And the other team's trying to shoot it or the game's tied or something like that, then yes. But if they're just lopping it down there, I think you can tell by the intention of the shot that was taken or how the puck was hit. That to me was how we determine mm -hmm. if it was a shot or not. And to add to that, the intent is part of a shot on goal. There has to be a bit of intent. So there's a bit of judgment involved. If you don't know, I usually give the benefit of the doubt to the shooter and assume that he's he's shooting. Because uh, sometimes you just dump the puck down the ice and it, the goalie makes a save. But if, if there's absolutely no intent for him to shoot on that, eh, it's not really a shot on goal. Unless the goalie has to make a spectacular save. Maybe the puck bounced funly, funny and uh, he had to you know flop over and make a an unusual save or whatever. And typically, there has to be a bit of intent from the shooter to try and shoot on that. And also that it has to be a goalie. So, for example, in an empty net situation, uh, if the goalie's out and a defenseman moves back into the net to try and block a, a shot when the other team gets the puck, if the defenseman makes a save, even if he's in the goalie crease, uh, it's not a shot on goal because a shot on goal has to be on a goalie. So if there's no if there's no goalie in the net, then the def and defenseman blocks it, it counts as a block shot the same way. Uh, as if the goalie was a net and then the defenseman was three feet in front of him and blocked the shot. So the uh, in order to be a save, the save has to register on a goalie. You can't register a save on a defenseman or a, a forward unless they've been moved into the net with equipment to play because of an injury. Um, so typically it has to be on a goalie and it has to be a shot that could score, as Alyssa said. I was going to ask you about that because you had mentioned that Canada – even just the terminology and, and how you refer to the stats, you pay attention to saves more than shots. Uh, it's actually the reverse. In the States, oh, yeah. you hear, all you hear about is saves, saves per period. We don't really refer to that much in Canada that way. It's, we talk about shots on net. What were the shots? What were, you know, we don't say what were the saves. So, But they're both the same thing. One is just a derivative of the other. Uh, a, a save is a, is, um, the, a shot. So typically we use shots on goal for for our discussion, when we talk about what happened in the game, we'll say we outshot them 23 to 3 in the period. We don't talk about we had so many saves, but essentially the goalies get credit with saves. Mm -hmm. So moving on to assists, Tim, uh, you with more people on your staff, how do you track your assists, double check for these, or determine if a player has an assist? 
Well, um, more often than not, there's an assist. Uh, there's and there's a second assist as well. Typically, if there's if a player has touched the puck, and then another player on your team touches the puck, and then somebody scores it, you got a secondary assist for the most part. I keep. I'm actually looking down at the NCA stats manual. Right, like, this You're is so that I have. Today. This is the one that I have at all our games. I, I you know, I'm and there's, it's goals and assists have a big section in this. So it, it's it's best to familiarize with this yourself with this. In in game though, again, if you don't have a setup, if it's just you and another student scoring a game, you can always go back and fix the assist. Just got to if you can get a hold of the film. We always we have instances at this level where we have to fix assists after the game. So don't feel paralyzed in the middle of a game if you miss an assist and you're trying to get it. You don't want to miss the next play that's happening. So um, what's nice about um, the NCAA Live Stats program is you can put a goal in and then you can skip over plus minus. You can skip over the assists and move on to the next play. And it's easy enough to go back in and add the plus minus and add the assists. Um, so Assists can be tricky to see. Sometimes there's very long assists. If I pass a puck to Earl, and Earl skates around and skates around and skates around, never loses any uh, possession, feeds it to Elisa, and she scores, I get an assist because we never lost possession. My pass didn't lead directly to that goal, but it's still an assist in hockey. It's different in, from sport to sport. Um, in basketball, an assist has to lead directly to a basket. That's how you quantify an assist in basketball. That's not the case in hockey. It's uh, in a lot of instances, it's if you touched the puck and there was no change of possession in between your passing or touching the puck. It doesn't even have to be a pass a lot of times. It's just a touch to when the goal is scored. It's an assist. So um, familiarizing yourself with the stats manual is the best thing to do. It does take practice. But again, don't get stuck in game trying to figure out assist and miss the next three or four plays that happen in the game. That's my number one rule when it comes to assists. And Tim and I had talked that we are fortunate to have a lot of streams and video that we can refer back to to track those assists. But Elissa, what about you? What when you miss an assist, who do you check with? So what normally happens with us is we. Um, we do have a, like our webcast and then our teams are also responsible for doing their game film. Um, and sometimes if there's no assists or it seems wrong, like I've asked my teams at home anyway, like if we announce like a goal and some assists and they know it's wrong, please tell me. <laughs> so I can at least make a note and double check on the film after the fact, or we can make the correction because it's obviously easier to do the correction right then and there in game. But I'm also lucky enough to be standing next to my bench, right? Like my bench is right here. My penalty box is all right there. So I have that that benefit. Um, but after the fact too, like when it mm -hmm. like breaks down our game film, it tells you who scored all the assists, like all the goals and all the assists. So if there's a discrepancy, we can compare it to that. And our coaches will email us and say, there, you know, this is missing an assist or it should have been eight instead of 88 and all that kind of stuff. So then we can go back in the film and take a look and then just make the change. Mm -hmm. One other thing that comes in handy on your line chart, you know the 26 scored the goal and you're trying to figure out how to add the assist, chances are it might be one of the other people on that line. So in a pinch, if you're trying to figure out who it was, maybe it's one of the uh, other people on the line. Um, one other thing that's an interesting um, point, you might not even be on the ice to get, you don't necessarily need to be on the ice to get an assist. In that instance, I already showed you earlier, you could make the pass, skate off during a line change, and as long as your team doesn't lose possession, you still get an assist. So you wouldn't you wouldn't be in the plus minus for that goal, but you'd have an assist. So that is a that is possible in in the hockey world. Mm -hmm. And Earl, you know, as we've all kind of mentioned, these assist changes might happen after the game too, um, or over the weekend or things like that. What is your process to submit for point change requests? Yeah, I, I would say it happens virtually every game or almost every game where we get a request either from the other SID or from our coach or the visiting coach or whatever uh, to to change and assist. We always look at, uh, at, at McGill anyway, we always look at the video to confirm. So most of our games are streamed and all of our league games are streamed. It's a requirement. And uh, what I do is I always review the video and uh, if it looks like they're right, then then I go with the, their uh, their request. 
typically um, on the men's hockey, uh, I'm ha I have the luxury of good of having a good rapport with my coaches, and they allow me in the coaches' room between periods, and I review every goal, home and away. And that way, there's no headaches. Um, you know a day later or two days later where you're scrambling and the story has been written that some guy had five points turns out that he actually had six or whatever he had three based on the video review so i try and get all the changes done by the end of the game so each intermission i go into the coach's office and i just stand in the background while they're looking at video because they review all kinds of plays face-offs and uh, whatever and when they're done with it then they go in to address their team and that's when I sit down with the video guy and ask him to review each goal and I do all goals home and away and then uh, at the end of the game I do the same thing so ideally you want to have only a couple goals each period type that you have to look at so you don't want to wait until the end of the game for all the goals and you know if there's a high scoring game you can spend half an hour after a game looking through every goal so that's why I do it after each period and then we make the change. And every time we make a change, we always announce it on the PA system so that it's not a it's not a state secret. Uh, it doesn't you know, it doesn't look like we're covering up something. And I always try to involve the other SID if they're right nearby or I'll send them a note when there's a correction saying, hey, there's been a, a, a request for a review of this. And we checked it. And yes, we made the change. So both schools have the same thing, because if you write a story for your website or where, wherever you're posting your story and i write a story and we both have different stats it looks kind of fishy and then which one's the official one and if someone's got a streak like a point scoring streak going okay. and it, it may end because we made a change in the scoring thing or it may continue so it's important that both sides have the the stat change and corrected and they use the same stats file for their website and our national office statistics as well so uh, that's sort of the way we do things. I I I think video review is really important. Uh, unfortunately, for our women's side, we're we're not set up for video review, and the the coaches don't have it in the intermissions. They get it from this um, uh, program that comes, I think, a day later. That from cameras that are all around the Instat. rink. I think it's called the Instat, and so Instat. they have cameras Instat. cameras all around the rink, and they and they somehow calculate statistics. I'm not even sure that how accurate that is, to be honest with you. I don't really trust it um, unless they have actual bodies, um, people analyzing and looking at things. And I'm not sure that I think it's an AI system, but anyway, uh, we don't have, <laughs> yeah, we don't have uh, uh, a, a review for our women's hockey in period. It's only after the game or the next day. So it's more of a headache, but there's less problems I find in the women's hockey for assists. Uh, there, there's still problems, but it's less because the game is a little slower and maybe it's easier to get the assist. I, I'm not sure if that's the reason, the, the number one reason. But anyway, it's more problematic there. And in, in, in men's hockey, it, the game is so fast, you really have to have some sort of video review. Mm -hmm. So before the, we move at on, the end of the day, these, oops, sorry, go ahead. no, it's OK. Real quick. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I think the, the home team has the last say on um, like scoring decisions, too. Um, I've had instances where I thought something was an assist and I asked the opposing SID to make it, but they disagreed and it it is what it is. You got to kind of roll with the official score is the home SID. So, um, uh, and it, the other kind of rule of thumb we have uh, also in our league as well is to have assists requests or any scoring requests in no more or within 24 hours. If it's after that, you know, it's like, in some circumstances, I'll I'll do it, but I mean, at the end of the day, if you can't have something done in uh, less than twenty four hours, um, we got to kind of move on. Kind of Earl's point, you gotta, you know, you, you can't drag it out over you know a week and say, oh wait, uh, that goal was twenty two, not twenty three. You know what I mean? So the best you can do, um, that, there's exceptions, but for the most part, it's twenty four hours in our league. Especially between that Friday to Saturday, like that that makes sense, you know, and so. There's a quick turnaround in game, so that is important. Um, but before we move on to penalties, I just want to remind people, feel free to ask your questions with the Q&A feature. Um, we'll get to those as they're asked. Um, so yeah, up next, we're going to talk about penalties. So there's a whole variety. Um, we have the two-minute minor, five-minute major, game misconducts, DQs, delayed penalties. Um, so there's a lot to keep track of. Um, with that, Elissa, you're in... The penalty box but what are other ways that you can determine what a penalty call is well one of the things that i do with my student staff um especially when i'm first training them but it's just part of our manual that's in the box is i sometimes you know if they're not someone who's played hockey or they're just you know a sports enthusiast they don't necessarily know all the calls 
or sometimes there's a very rare call it's called. So one of the things I do, and I printed just a page of it, is I, Hockey Canada has a um, referee call sheet in their, in their manual. So what we do is we print it out and we keep it in the box. And I especially pull it out when we're training new people at the beginning of the season. And I always have them refer to it because, you know, sometimes like when you're training them in a men's game, it's great, but then, and they learn it. But then if they're doing a women's game, there's penalties there, for example, checking, body checking that isn't called in the men's game. So we need to be able to have that reference. So that's one of the things that I do to um, just help them along because, you know, we all know that everyone thinks this is cross-checking and it's not, it's interference. So um, that's just one of the things, you know, just to help keep clear, mm -hmm. keep things clear. And so with that one, there's penalties. Um, Earl, can you describe what a power play is and how to determine if a team has one? Yeah, it's amazing to me that that seems to be the most commonly um, problematic area. Well, maybe I'm not amazed by it. Been doing stats for a long time. And I, whenever I look at as, as the uh, results from a game, it amazes me how often I see the power plays are not correct. Uh, power play is based on a penalty creating a, a shorthanded situation. So if two teams are equal on the ice, then it's not a power play. And equal means all players on the ice, including the goalies. So if a, if a team pulls its goalie in the last minute of play, it's not a power play. They might have more skaters compared to the other team, but it's the total number of players on the ice, including the goalies, that determines manpower. If you have if you pull your goalie, you still have six players on the ice, and the other team has six players on the ice, or uh, five skaters and a goalie. It's still even strength. So basically, it, a penalty has to cause you to be shorthanded to have a power play situation. That's sort of the, the simple rule of thumb. Uh, penalties can be very confusing when you have overlapping penalties. Uh, that's the part that's the hardest one to really grasp, uh, for most people to grasp. So, for example, if you get a two-minute penalty um, at, let's say, 11.30 of the period, and the other team gets a penalty two minutes later, uh, 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 sorry, a minute later at 12.30, and then, uh, so both teams get a power play. Some, might, it might only be a short five second power play or whatever, but both teams get a power play. But if another penalty happens right after, so in other words, you have one in the eighth minute, the ninth minute, the 10th minute, usually the penalty in the middle is is negated as a power play because they're never shorthanded. Now you have to sit there and do the math and figure out, are they shorthanded for a few seconds? If they are shorthanded for a few seconds, then it counts as a power play. But invariably when you have three three in a row, and one is sandwiched by the other two. So in other words, team A is the first penalty, team A is the third penalty, but team B gets a penalty in between and they're all in the same sequence, seventh minute, eighth minute, ninth minute of play. Typically the middle penalty is not a power play because they're never shorthanded. And likewise on a, a major penalty, if one team gets a five minute major and they're shorthanded, then a minute or two minutes later, the other team gets a penalty. That penalty is not a power play because the five minute major is negating the, the second penalty in terms of having a man advantage situation. So that's sort of the simple rule of thumb. Uh, so one example that is commonly a, a confusing on a major, let's say you get a major in the fifth minute of play and the other team gets a minor in the seventh minute and that's all the penalties that are required. So what happens is the, the second penalty doesn't count as a power play because the first team is shorthanded. But the first team, there's two situations where they're shorthanded. They're shorthanded at the start then they're at even strength because of the second penalty to the other side. And then when that penalty expires, they're still on the, uh, there's still a power play. So in that instance, the, the first team gets uh, two shorthanded situations, it's two power plays for the other team. So that's the, uh, the rule of thumb that has to be uh, uh, understood a little clearer. And maybe I didn't explain it clear enough, but if, if you do mention, if, if you do look at the, uh, the, the case book that it, it's well explained and the NCA has a very good uh, uh, thing as we saw earlier. Um, the NCA, I think it's called the ice and the NCA ice hockey statisticians manual. I believe that's what it's called. That explains those situations quite clearly. It's, it's only a couple of pages long and it's really um, quite worthwhile to read that and get a grasp of, of these complicated uh, situations. So to make some of these little complicated situations a little more, uh, Tim, some teams might pull their goalie during a delayed penalty or at the end of the game. Um, talk about, yeah, exactly. Like, is it a power play, not a power play? Um, and in those odd situations. Uh, when you pull your goalie, it is not a power play goal. Uh, 
it's uh, it's an extra man goal, right? But, uh, but it's not a power play goal. I mean, it's uh, yeah. Uh, tracking when your goalie goes off, like if there's a delayed penalty and you're, you you see your goalie skating off and they blow the whistle right before he gets the, over the boards, I usually don't even take the goalie off in that situation. But if, if the goalie on a delayed penalty gets to the boards, gets over, I will. You know, that's when we will pull the goalie and take it in that situation. And then when, when the goalie comes back on, when it stops, you put him back in. So um, it's it's not a power play when the goalie uh, comes off during it. And it, it is it's an it, odd situation. Like even at the end of the game, if you have a penalty, um, like Earl said, it's essentially like our overall players on the ice. Are you short? You know, you can have an extra attacker shorthanded goal. Like that is a thing because you're still short a player. Um, even I, if it only comes. I, out. I, I think what's good about the genius product as well. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. Mm -hmm. I think anytime you take a player off the ice, you mark it as a power play in the program, even though technically it's not like in uh, it, it, that's just the, the way the genius program gets the players off the ice. If you're, and I think that's kind of the rule of thumb we go by. If there, if a player is taken off the ice, you mark it as power play in the genius software. Um, it's, it, it can be a little confusing and trying to figure out the numbers and things like that. But I think, you know, again, I'm reading my stat manual here. I think that the good term to remember is the number of power play opportunities should be equal to the maximum number of power play goals that could be scored. Right. So no single minor penalty can ever create more than one power play opportunity. So again, it's, there's a pretty good breakdown of power plays and how it works in the stat manual. So again, getting familiar with that is a good idea. In addition to, uh, you know, kind of trusting that, the software does its thing when you're using that when you're using genius. Mm -hmm. And I think the final thing we talked about in our call um, preparing for this was the difference in a DQ versus a game misconduct, because they have very different implications for players when moving ahead. Um, Earl, can you talk about, Earl, I thought it was interesting too. You said Canada has a whole, another category based on yeah. stick infractions. Yeah, we, we have so, uh, Between we have the three. Yeah, we don't have a DQ. We we have just the game misconduct, and that that serves as a, I guess as a DQ. I'm not even sure how the DQ is ruled upon it in the NCA, but in in Canada, it's either a minute a minor major misconduct, which is ten minutes, or a game misconduct, which also counts as ten. Uh, and so, if a player gets, uh, we have a stick rule. So if you get three stick related penalties, minor penalties, so that means slashing, cross checking, uh, spearing. If you get a, a stick-related penalty in three separate stoppages, so in other words, that excludes a double minor. A double minor for slashing counts as one towards that thick rule. It, it doesn't count as two, even though he gets two penalties. It's three separate stoppages. If you have a stick penalty, you get ejected from the game. So it's it comes with um, a game ejection, a GE, as we mark it down on the, the code. Uh, and they the league keeps track of that. And once you get more than one, the first time in instances you, you get a warning, the second time there's a suspension involved. Now for game misconduct penalties, which uh, occurs with any fight, any match penalty, um, for, or for any reason that the referee chooses to give a game misconduct in Canada, uh, those come with automatic suspensions. And, and depending on the code, the type of penalty you get, it could be one game, two games, three games, et cetera. So we uh, we have to keep track of that. And we even keep track of our 10-minute misconduct penalties. If you get if you get certain 10-minute misconduct penalties, um, maybe abuse of official, I'd have to look to, to be sure. Certain 10-minute misconduct penalties are um, lead to suspensions also. Not, not the first time it happens, but the, every time it happens like uh, after that. So the league keeps track of that and it's important for our coach to know which kind of 10 minute misconduct penalties his players keep track of. So it's a, it's a little bit confusing, but if you read the rules, they're, they're quite clear in, in the rule book. And, and the other thing that I wanted to mention about uh, a common mistake that I see is when a player gets five minutes in, in Canada, I believe it's the same in the States, you're automatically kicked out of the game. So when you're, when you're kicked out, that comes with an automatic game misconduct. So every time you get a five, regardless of what it's for, if you're kicked out of the game, then you have to get an automatic game misconduct penalty in Canada. And in the States, maybe it's a, a DQ that you get. I'm not really sure how that works, but in the NCA, but uh, you have to write in a second penalty. It, it's not just five minutes on the score sheet. It's five 
plus the game or five plus a DQ or five plus the game ejection, the GE type of penalty. Yeah. So Tim, can you tell, tell everyone what our games are like or when it comes to these major penalties? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's pretty common to get a five and a 10, right? You get, you get a five minute major in a game misconduct, which means you're going to have somebody in the box for five minutes and that player gets kicked out of the game. There is also a misconduct penalty, which means a player gets 10 minutes he has to, he can't come back in for 10 minutes, right? He's sent to the box for 10 minutes. He can't come back until the 10 minutes is up. So that's the difference between a misconduct and a game. Typically, or like Earl said, there's usually another penalty that goes along with that. Usually you just get a misconduct penalty. You'll get a, you'll get a, a five minute contact at the head and a game misconduct. So it is two separate penalties that you have to input again. Uh, I'm familiar with, uh, you know, the Genius software. That's how you do it. It actually is two separate inputs in um, the software. And then when it comes to the DQ, that's one where a player has to automatically sit next game. So it's important to be clear. Sometimes, you know, officials will just say, oh, they're they, they're disqualified. And it's like, no, well, then they got to sit next game versus a misconduct. They're just out for this game. So it is important to clarify those those details when you're inputting. I think that that might be up to the leagues. That's kind of up to the leagues as well. I think they typically review it. And if it's egregious enough, they'll make them sit out. And there's, they usually, we get those emails, you know, Tim Volkman is suspended one game for being stupid the last game against Canisius, right? So I think there is, I think there is a review process there. Um, So it's not automatically if you get, if you get a game misconduct, but I think to your point, a lot of them do. Mm-hmm. Then maybe you could just explain the difference between the DQ and a GM penalty, a game versus a disqualification. The, to me, they're essentially the same. We don't have a DQ in Canada. So what's the difference between a game and a, and a DQ? Yeah, in my experience, the game, um, they just go out for that game. And then it once you get three game misconducts, then you are suspended for a game. That's been the default. Um, a DQ, they automatically sit the next game. Um And so uh, they're really rare. Honestly, I've only had DQs come into my career against Windsor um, for, for a whole big situation at the end of the game. But um, so they're much more rare. (laughs) Yeah. So it's important, but it's rare. Mm -hmm. One other penalty I, I wanted to mention that we have in Canada. I'm not sure if you have that in the NCA is, um, we have a, it, fights are very rare on both sides of the border, but they do happen uh, probably more often in Canada than they happen in the NCA. And so we have a rule that uh, the coaches implemented probably five years ago, maybe even 10, I lost track, where if a player instigates a fight, so the referee can give an instigator minor in addition to the five minute um, major for fighting and the automatic game is conic. And if you get, if you entice another player into the fight and an instigator penalty is called on one, the other guy that gets the five minute major for fighting is not ejected from the game. He can still play after his five minutes. That's if the, if the instigator penalty is called. So you'd have one side would have a two, a five and a game, which is 10 minutes. And the other side would have just a five minute penalty and nothing else. And, uh, uh, that's the only instance where a major penalty in Canada does not require a game misconduct that comes with it because of the instigator rule. I might be, I might be mistaken, but I don't think there's anything like that, but I kind of wish there was Earl, you know what I mean? I think it would lend uh, lend itself to officiating consistency in a lot of ways, but uh, yeah, there, I, I do not believe there's any of that in States. Mm-hmm. So getting into a few other, not penalty related, but other a few differences and quirks and things like that. Um, not just hockey, but compared to other sports. Um, one thing we had talked about was when it comes to these lines and line changes, you're not required to record subs in and out of the game. Could you imagine in hockey um, statting every player change on the ice? Obviously, there are programs that record time on ice. So does anyone here want to elaborate why your stats team might not be doing that versus maybe your ops guy? I have one person, so I can't. (laughs) I'm limited just to the one person, right? And it's not required by our league for us to do it. So it's something that we just don't do because if if one school is doing it, then yeah. That'd be super hard to keep track of. I think I think that's also something that um, the coaches programs that they use like instead afterwards will track for them. So um, I 
I, I, it would be really, really hard to track time on ice. Um, uh, way we have our setup just because you know there's jailbreaks happening all the time there's guys going on and off and up and down and people go on the lines change things like that um, so yeah that would be super difficult i think the future the future of that is probably it's too hard for us to um to manage keeping track of that set unless it's all automated and i and i believe that the future is some sort of ai system where you have uh you know um some sort of uh, pin or something not a pin not the right word but something a magnetic attached to your your to the player's body and he it keeps track of their time on ice that way I, I could see that happening in the future where everything is done through some sort of device that you have uh, in your uniform exactly and then another difference we talked about um is plus minus uh tim you record plus minus but earl and elisa you don't Yep, we do. Um, it's it's not an NCA stat that um, is tracked. I mean, you can. I think it's a stat that's been around for a while, and I think it's just kind of uh, something that it, it's a stat that our radio guys will use. You know, um, I think it does show a little bit of a player playing well if he has a high plus. You know what I mean? So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, plus minus actually only counts when you're even strength as well. Um, you have to keep track of the plus minus, even when it's a power play goal in the program, right? I mean, that does, if you're not, you, you're not given a minus if you're on the, on the ice for when the other team scores a power play goal, but um, it is just a matter of keeping track of who's on the ice. We, uh, there's, I've seen people that will write everybody on the ice for a team. And then when one goes off or a line changes, they'll scratch it off and write it again. Or there's ways, or there's um, our kids that will write it all down when a goal is scored. You know, they'll, they'll kind of they'll watch the goal and they'll write everybody down before they jump off the ice. Um, the goal scoring team is a little easier because usually they'll skate by the bench and um, you know high five all their teammates. So the lot you kind of know who was on the ice during the goal. Another um, uh, tip the person that usually leads that is the goal scorer they usually let the goal scorer go first so if you think if you're not sure who scored the, scored the goal chances are it's the guy who's leading the uh the high fives down the uh down the bench so um yeah that's kind of the different ways i've seen plus minus kept at our post mm -hmm. that's yeah that's a really good point and another way to double check your stats if you aren't totally sure <laughs> and we actually I've, I've seen a kid we've had some kids that'll use different colored post-its as well they'll put you know the orange one will be RIT and the blue one will be Canisius. So if we have to go back in later to enter our plus minus, I know exactly it says goal number one and it's on the it's on the orange post-it. I know that was our plus minus and the other one is from the other team. So that's maybe and that works pretty well. And I think that's important. Like you said, go back and do it. Um that's definitely something that does not have to be immediate. Um media timeouts was usually when I'd be entering those or intermissions, breaks like that. Um, a lot happens in hockey. It's a fast paced game. And so uh, it's important that not all of it has to happen right away, but taking those breaks and and filling in and rounding out those stats. Um, so speaking of it being fast paced, uh, there might be hiccups. So Elissa, uh, when there's a lot of back to back action, how important is continued com uh, communication between the caller and the inputter? Well, very good, very important, but as I said, I only have one. So he's the caller and inputter are one and the same. Um, but because my clock person and my announcer are also in the booth, um, they work as a team and there's a lot of scrap paper. So what I ask them to do is they always just scribble it on a piece of paper first before there's anything, um, before they put it in the computer, before they put it on the game sheet. And then that way um, they can always just double check, make sure they have they've reversed the time properly so that they're entering it in correctly and they're not stressed out about it there too. And then the announcer also has it um, as well. And then if there's any questions, they can always, um, you know, hit the buzzer. And I always say this to them. I say, guys, if you're concerned about anything or if you have any questions or if all hell is broken loose and like they've told you four different things and you want to make sure you got it right, just hit the horn before. So the refs won't start the game again. Right. And then they'll come over. And you can just say, okay, I'm just confirming this, 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 and this is all right. And then they'll say yes, because they appreciate that over you 
panicking, not doing anything, putting up the wrong time or not having it all right. And then they have to come back mid game and the coaches are screaming. It's just a lot easier. That horn is your friend, right? Paper, pen, and horn are your friends. But I think both Tim and Earl mentioned that old fashioned of, of having emergency sheets um, in those Absolutely. in those crazy times, right? You, you can't go wrong by writing things down. I mean, uh, you know, I do football stats for our team as well. Um, and we write, you have to write everything. Like if you have a, a power failure or some, whatever, some medical problem or some situation and your system is down, you're, you're screwed if you don't have that written down. So it's really important to keep notes. Uh, we do that all the time. And as Alyssa said, the, uh, the buzzer is a friend for the scorer, the, the guy in the penalty box. It's, uh, I'm not sure of something, especially in a situation where they didn't hear the whistle right away. And let's say a couple of extra seconds ticked off. You got to push the buzzer, let the referee know that you missed about three seconds or something like that. And the referee will either say, okay, count to three before you start the clock again, or the referee will make you tick, revise the clock and, uh, you know, change the, the time showing or, or whatever. So uh, if they're unsure, they should push the buzzer. Now, ideally, you don't want to do that five times in a game. But uh, it's better to be, to do it that way than to be unsure, and then you have someone accusing accusing the score of uh, you know playing favorites with the clock and things like that. All right, so I'll just send uh, put out another reminder of using that Q and A feature if you have some questions in our final minutes here. But we're moving on now to wrapping up the game. So Earl, can you run through what is your post game like? What what are your steps to to finalize those stats? Well, for our games, we we uh, do it in three parts. We do it after each period. So what happens is, I, I know in, in the NCA or most most NCA schools, I think now don't use a score sheet, an official score sheet. It's all computer generated, if I'm correct. But mm -hmm. in Canada, we use a score sheet. And so what we do is the the person sitting in the pre, in the penalty box uh, scoring the game comes up after each intermission and checks with the person doing the stats upstairs online. Because some people could, I guess, do the stats online in the penalty box. We don't. We have a person upstairs doing the stats and the person downstairs filling in the score sheet. So after each period, that person comes up and we check at the start of the game. They check, do they have the same starting lineup? Do they both have 20 players on each team? Because sometimes one might have a mistake and maybe there's only 19 players. So they, they double check with each other at, at, at each possible instance. So before the game, they check to make sure the same number of players on each team uh, on the score sheet versus what's online. And then after the first period, we check all the goals, assists, penalties. And do they all match? Yes. And then we do it again after the second period and the shots on goal as well. And then we do it again at the end of the game. So we do it in, in three steps so that you don't have a huge delay at the end of the game trying to solve something that happened in the first period that you could have resolved in the intermission very easily by double checking. And then we also, uh, we, ch we check the video on, in the intermissions as well for our, at least for the men's game. And we'll change assists quite often based on the video review. And so Elissa, for you, can you run through your post, post game? Yes, so similar to Earl, um, we also, you know, correct anything we can um, at the intermission. Um, but, and I, we use the same program, we use League Stat. So one of the things um, that League Stat has is a game report button. So you can click on it and it generates an electronic version of the game sheet. So what we do is we always, you know, look at that sheet and make sure that it matches the hard copy of the sheet, because then you know we've entered all the stats incorrectly online. It tells us how many power plays, how many empty sets, the time, everything like that. So if we know that it, the electronic version is matching what's on the paper copy, um, then we know that we've got the stats, you know, correct and done. And then another thing that I do is we have the uh, officials, because it's paper, we have them sign it on the ice. I know a lot of schools, the official takes it and goes back to their dressing rooms and they review it and sign it. It adds like 10, 15 minutes to the whole process. Um, ours keep their dressing room key with us in the box so they don't get their key back until they uh, sign the game sheet. Um, now, the only time that they do take it back is if all, as I said, you know, all hell breaks loose or there was a complicated penalty or something like that and they want to just review it, um, then absolutely they take it back, make sure, especially if someone's been kicked out and they're going to be suspended, we want to make sure all the notes on the back of the game sheet are properly uh, recorded so that, they're, that that person can, you know, serve their suspension properly and not be given too much time or not enough time and stuff like that. That's a really important note of getting that referee signature. Um, Tim, yours is a little different because you have some media at your game. So can you talk about wrapping up the stats part and then how that plays into your post game? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of like Earl and Lisa were talking about. You want to kind of keep up with the game as it goes. You want to do your best to have your assists set because that's what the media wants to know. Like they want to know that some goal can finish with you know two goals and two assists. You know what I mean? So the best you can do, you want to have the stats correct. If our radio guy announces an assist wrong, and it's it's life goes on, right? You're, you're going to miss some sometimes, but you you want to do your due diligence and do your best to have all of the um, the points uh, correct by the end of the game. So you can print a box score um, and give it to the, the, the TV, the, the guys on TV and the guys in the in the radio booth. Um, and then I usually have a student go down and get a signature on the box score from the officials. They want to obviously, you know, similar to um, what the other two said, it's they, they want to check the, the, the penalties. They want to make sure those game is kind of and it's made, all of those were assessed correctly. Um, the officials typically don't care about the goals and assists. They just want to look at the penalties. So once they've seen that, they sign it. My student brings it back up and I put it in a file and no one's ever asked me for one. And uh, now five seasons of hockey here at RIT, no one's ever actually, hey, do you have that box score that was signed by the official the other day? But I'm sure it'll happen and I'll need to have it. So it's always a good idea to keep those somewhere. Well, something so, but, yeah. we have to do too. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, just to follow up on that, with you keeping them, something we have to do as well is we have to send the game sheet, a copy of the game sheet to our conference office, as well as the opposing SID. Um, so we have to keep a copy. We keep it obviously for eligibility reasons and in suspension reasons, but we have to send it to the league and to the other team. And then if obviously something uh, like a major penalty happened and someone's been um, ejected, then we have to send the back of it too with all the notes and then mention that in the email as well. One other thing that we usually do at the end of the game is when you finalize it in our staff program, Genius, um, it gets uploaded to the NSCM, where it's the database where all the games are kept, and the opposing SID can download it. So I will typically just send, I'll try to send a text to the other SID to say, hey, the game's ready to download. You know, it's kind of a cool little courtesy thing. It used to be sending the game file after the game, but now it's kind of, the courtesy is, hey, the game has been finalized. Or if it's taking it, like if something got screwed up mm -hmm. or you're trying to figure something out, it's a text to the other SID saying, hey, I'm trying to figure something out. Game isn't finalized yet. I'll let you know when it's ready to be downloaded. So it's just kind of that courtesy. We'll let the other SID know when the game has been finalized or if there's been a delay, just so they're not left hanging, uh, wondering what's going on. That's really big. You know, yeah, like you said, a courtesy. Then they're not checking back multiple times and interrupting their night. I'm sure they have other home games and things going on. <laughs> there was one other thing that came to mind that I do at the end of the games that maybe would be a good practice for people to do is uh, I always, first of all, look at the goalie times. And if it's not around 60, usually it means someone made a mistake on a data entry or something. So, for example, uh, so what happens sometimes in in, uh, in the system, we use hockey stat slash league stat, whatever we call hockey tech league stat. Uh, you put in the time the goalie starts, but sometimes the score by mistake puts the time that's on the clock. So he'll mm. put 20 minutes at the start of the game instead of zero minutes. And when you do that, it assumes that the guy started playing in the 20th minute. And so at the end of the game, you'll see 40 minutes listed for the goalie. And you say, well, what's that all about? So I go back and check the times that he listed the goalie. And you see, oh, he entered the, the start of the goalie at 20 minutes instead of zero minutes. So I always check the goalie minutes to see if it's close to 60. And of course, if there's overtime, it's more than 60. And I also check the um, the power plays. Uh, typically in most games, there'll be three, four, five, six power plays per team, max. Uh, I saw there was a game last week and I noticed, um, I review other games and I, I spot little things like that all the time. There was one game where one team had 10 power play chances and the other team had 11. So they were 0 for 11 and 0 for 10. And I go, wow, that's got to be a lot of penalties there. I, I looked and I saw that every penalty in the game, including misconducts and uh, game misconducts, et cetera, were marked as a power play. So I, I look at the these numbers and I see, well, there's probably something wrong with that if it's that high. There, there shouldn't be a game or it's very rare that it happens where there's 10 power plays for one team in a game. So if, if you sort of train yourself to look at the end of the game to say, how many power plays were there for both teams? Three, four, five is probably right. If it's, if it's a huge number, it's probably wrong. And then double check in the time for the goalies. And we're wrapping up, but you kind of led into like one other topic we were maybe going to touch on. 
And it was when a team might use multiple goalies. So when those minutes are different and they're not an easy 60, how do you determine who gets the win and who gets the loss? Yeah, well, the system, the most systems that are automated will, will have that in, in place automatically unless you do it manually. But the rule of thumb is the, go the goalie that's in net at the time of the goal that proves to be the winning goal. So if the score ends up 9-8, it's the goalie, the, the ninth goal uh, that uh, is the winning goal. That means whoever was in nets at that time for both teams, one gets the win, one gets the loss. And likewise, if the score was 9-3, the fourth goal proves to be the winning goal. So whichever goalie was in net for the fourth goal uh, for the winning side gets the win, and the other goalie that was in net at that same time is the losing goalie. It's a, it's a little odd when you have them changing back and forth. Sometimes it doesn't happen. It's very rare, but it does happen. But that's the rule of thumb is whenever the winning goal is scored and the winning goal is determined by the team that has more, um, the goal that was scored one more than the, the losing side had. Oh, can you imagine standing a nine, eight game? Ooh. We had a game this year, uh, a game this year where we lost 11, five. That's crazy. That kept you busy. Yeah, it was insane. <laughs> And we changed our goalie about four times. It was a game from hell. You got notes for us, Tim? That's covered right here. <laughs> Section six, article one. So uh, again, familiar, familiarize yourself with the old stats manual. It'll save you a lot of headaches. And yeah, and I, refer I, to it in game. Refer to it in game too. You know, I I still do. You know what I mean? That's why I have a copy in my main bag folder with me for all games. It, it's definitely the or Bible. Can... Yeah, it's the Bible. You should no, just it... you just Google it, and you'll find the NCAA ice hockey stats manual. It's uh, it's mm -hmm. certainly a must to have. Sorry, Alyssa. Yeah, but for us in Canada too, we when in doubt, text Earl. That's what <laughs> That's we do. True. I just, I I just I, you know, the other thing that uh, I noticed, uh, like I get a lot of calls when the when a game goes, and especially in the playoffs, when it goes into double, triple, quadruple overtime. People are always wondering what's what's the record for overtime. And so it's important when you're doing overtime to record a like some sometimes some rules some conferences have a rule where it's a five minute overtime and then you play a twenty minute period for another overtime or it's a ten minute overtime and a twenty. So when you say it's double or triple overtime, it doesn't necessarily mean that each period is the same amount of time. So you have to be clear uh, when you have a, a a game that goes super long, how many minutes of overtime total there was when you're writing about the game, especially if it's something that's close to a record. Uh, instead of saying was quadruple overtime, well, okay, but how many minutes of overtime also? That's important to record that. And also in those games, um, we uh, like it's also important to record precisely when the game started and when it ended because it might be the long, you could read, you could spin a story that was the longest game ever played. It might not be the longest overtime, but maybe because there was a delay with the Zamboni machine or whatever, there's some injury. Or so it's important to know when your game started exactly. Not if it says seven o'clock doesn't mean the game started at seven. The anthem might have taken two minutes. So actually your game might have started at seven oh two. So things like that are important to mark the time it starts and the time it ends. All good notes. So with that, we don't want to keep you guys on too long. Um, but we'd like to big, give a big thanks to all of our presenters today for the this amazing discussion. I feel like we could have filled several hours with. Um, and all of your experience working with hockey statistics and stat rules and reviewing these difficult scoring situations. So we appreciate those that asked a few questions. Um, again, this webinar will be available on demand later today in video and podcast formats. And be sure to share this information with your colleagues, especially if you have anyone new to hockey or just need to brush up on hockey. It's for everyone. <laughs> Um, we encourage you to check out our website, collegesportcommunicators.com for updated information and what's on tap for CSC programming and continuing education. We'll have another statistics and stat rules webinar next week on Tuesday, January 30th, as we hold a live men's lacrosse statistics webinar at 2 p.m. Eastern with more sports to come in February. So stay tuned for those dates and topics to be announced. And thanks again for joining us today.